me is that feeling, you know, when you hit the switch, when you go up and you're waiting for that, that hit. It's a feeling that you can't describe, man. It's like, I hit the switch, I lift it, I three-wheel it, and it's like, it knows what to do, you know? It's like, it's unexplainable. People are like, dude, how do you do all that? And I'm like, I, I don't. <laughs> it's, like, it's like my fingers in the car. It's like we have a relationship already built. I think a lot of people that I talk to have their favorite car, you know? It's like, that's my baby, and this is my baby here. Having this car is amazing. So this is a 64 Impala SS. Purchased a car probably about two years ago. When I seen the car, I fell in love with it, man. I said, that's the blue that I've always dreamed of having, and at least since I was a kid, you know? It was, when I seen it, it was just like, it took me back to like kid memories, you know? You know, ever since that first day I got in it, you know, it was like amazing, you know, it just fits you. Everybody tells me, you know, hey, you got a bunch of cars, but why are you always in that car? I said, I don't know, man, this car is just made for me, you know, it's like we understand each other, we know each other. As soon as I feel it's about to break down, I'm like, yo, come on, let me just get to where I need to get. And sure enough, it, it helps me out. I can do whatever I want with it. You know, if I want to do three wheel to the left, three wheel to the left, three wheel to the right, three wheel to the right, has a high lockup has 16 batteries, four pumps, black magic pumps. Amazing, amazing car. The lift on it is really, really good. So smooth, so soft, you know? So I had it for about a year, you know, throughout a whole year of, of me just grabbing it and doing whatever I want with it. Finally, it asked for help, man. You know, things were coming off, the body started flexing on it, gaps were opening bigger, chips all over the place. Then finally the, the frame cracked, you know? And that's when I was like, all right, you gotta go into surgery, you know? And we made it fuel injection. You know, everybody brags about putting an LS in their car and stuff like that. I don't, man, I want a 350 block. We converted into a fuel injection car, added a different rear end, uh, did a higher lockup on it, square dumps all around. And I mean, the car is just does what it, what it wants, you know, when I wanted to do it. I left the interior alone. I, I was in love with the interior. Changed the arms, the treading arms, the, the rear end, pretty much redid the whole car. It was kind of like a color that I've always imagined having, like I wanted a blue car. I did get a couple of the blue cars. You know, I bought a Monte Carlo. It was already done by another good friend of mine. But this blue is just everywhere I go. It's like the, the, the attention of the eye, you know? It's like everybody wants to take a picture of it. Everybody wants to know what kind of a blue it is. I don't even know what type of blue it is. I don't even want to know because this is one of a kind. I don't want to share that info, but I have it in case I need it. I love the color, you know, and since it has attitude. Well, you're from LA, man. Like, you know, you, we're, we're Dodger fans, you know, since we're born. Growing up in Venice was cool. Born and raised in the city of Venice Beach, California, man. You know, it was different. It was a neighborhood, it was a hood, it was a ghetto, but it was dope, it was dope, because it was very multicultural. It was just amazing, but my dad got there in, the, in 79 year I was born. Just growing up there was different, you know, than, than a lot of my buddies that I know that grew up in Compton, South Central, or other neighborhoods. It's eight of us. It's, it's four sisters and, and three brothers that I have. I'm the seventh child of the family. That gets interesting, because <laughs> I was like the baby brother. You know, my, my mom and dad, they immigrated here from Hakuna, Michoacan, Mexico. They came here illegally, man. I know they got lucky when, they, when Ronald Reagan gave that uh, amnesty back in the 80s. My brothers and, and my mom and dad were able to fall into that. You know, I, they, they, my dad always called me like the seventh lucky child because I was born here. Coming, coming from an immigrant family where, you know, they knew the struggle of what it was to, to not have any papers and stuff like that compared to now. Me not having to know that life is a, it's very different, you know? My dad passed away uh, back in 2011. Never talked about it in film, so <laughs> might be a little weird. My dad loved cars. He loved Cadillacs, man. I still have his car. That's his car. It's, it's the same way he left it in the inside. My two oldest brothers, they worked at body shops all their lives. I grew up with cars. You know, it was like, it's always, I've always been around cars, no matter what. My brother owned a couple of cars growing up. I remember him letting me hit the switch, and that was like when I fell in love. You know, I was probably about 10 years old. You know, a lot of people don't know this, but growing up in the, in the, in the neighborhood, I was like that kid that would come around the people that had the cars. I washed my neighbor's car for like three months without him even knowing who was washing his car. It's a yellow Impala convertible. 
He didn't know who it was. He would just wake up and say, who's washing my car? Finally, the neighbor snitched on me and said, hey, it's little Jimmy. So he came knocking. He was like, yo, man, why are you doing that? I was like, dude, because I just wanted to touch your car. It was just that feeling when he was like, well, what do you want? I was like, nothing. <laughs> what anything. I just want to touch the car. I think my mindset was different from everybody else because I started, I started doing flyer parties since the age of 14. So all my buddies, it's like I knew everybody, man. I knew the gang members, I knew the, the geeks, I knew the smart guys, I knew all the jocks. So it's kind of like I, I was friends with a lot of different people, man. So yeah, where I grew up, it was a bunch of gangs. It was, it was a lot of it. And I grew up in the corner where it was like, right in the corner where I lived, it was 5th in Indiana and Venice. You know, as soon as you hear those gunshots, boom, you throw yourself on the floor, you know? Growing up with that, I kind of didn't want, I didn't want to live that life. And then I got pretty lucky, man, because I got buddies that kind of like kept me out of that. And my brothers too, man. My brothers kept me on check. They were like, yo, we don't want you doing this. Stop hanging around with these people. And, and, and they would explain to me why. And I did for, for a minute, I think I wanted to kind of like go into that gang member life. And, 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 the, and the buddies that I knew they, that, that were already gang members, they didn't let me, man. I think I got blessed by having people like that around me. You know, I had always had two, three different jobs. It was like, I, I was a dude that would wake up at seven, eight o'clock in the morning and just go and work, you know, and come back late. And unfortunately, I didn't get to graduate from high school, man. You know, I did drop out at the ninth grade. I don't recommend anybody to do it. A personal choice I made that I do regret. You know, I wish I would have finished school at least, but I went straight to work, man. You know, it's my dad talked to me and he said, hey, you know, you gotta, you gotta be a man. You know, you gotta, you gotta become a man and, and partying and doing drugs and out there living a, a life like that is not gonna take you anywhere. So I was able to go a different, a different way in life. When I bought one, bought the second one, then when I bought my third one, that's when I knew I was in trouble. You know, it was just like, uh-oh. Some crazy idea came to my head where, you know, there isn't much that, that represents the culture of low riding. I wanna build a low rider museum. It's something that I wanna do. You know, I wanna to put together. I think it's gonna represent our culture to the fullest. Not only the low riding, but it's also gonna represent the Mexican-American culture. You know, cause we're the ones that grew up with it. Well, when I was 13 to 14 years old, one of my cousins was drunk in the back, you know, and, and he asked me to give him a ride. I was like, I'll give you a ride? I don't know how to drive. You know, he's like, no, dude, come on. I'm not gonna drive drunk. You can do it. You know, and back in the days, like, you learn how to drive young, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, especially in the neighborhoods. I remember getting in that car. I didn't know how to drive, man. It was stick shift. He said, look, man, the only way you're gonna be able to do it is if you listen to good music. I remember him just popping the tape inside the cassette deck. His voice came out. Chalino Sanchez, and I was like, yo, what is this, bro? And he was like, it's Chalino, dude. Don't you know who Chalino is? As soon as he put it on, it's like, I, I went along to learn how to drive with it. I made sure I took the tape with me. <laughs> I took the tape, it was over from there. I fell in love with this music, man. And I kept following his, 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 his footsteps, but in Venice, nobody listened to that music. You know, Venice, it was like hip hop, rap. It was R&B, it was rock, heavy metal, punk music but nothing to do with corridos, bro. I've been in the music business, man, since I was 14 years old. This is all I know how to do, I do music. You know, I don't know how to do anything else. I eat, sleep, and take craps all day with music. This is it's all I know how to do, and, and I love it. I enjoy it, it's my life. To me, it's not work, it's, it's part of me. Natanael Cano, which is my artist, and then Alejandro Fernandez, which is a huge legend in, in the Mexican regional music, so. Being, being a Chicano, being raised here in the US and having my parents straight from Mexico and me being involved in the music, I did get involved with that type of music, you know? A lot of my bands came from Mexico and they would sing those type of corridos. But then I wanted I wanted something different. I wanted something to represent our culture. One thing that I didn't want is that I seen that our kids here in the US were losing our culture. Not the Chicano culture and all that and the Latino, but they were losing the culture of, of the Spanish music. You know, because now we're going into second, third, fourth, even fifth generations of Mexican-American. And when I decided to put this together, I wanted to make an urban Mexican type of music and it worked, bro. I don't know how I did it. I mean, I can sit here and tell you, oh, I did this, I did that. But I really don't know, man. It just, from years, you know, I, I kept doing it. You know, it started going little by little from, you know, help from others. A lot of buddies, you know, participated with me and in, in, in putting this together. I have a couple of partners I've been with all my life. I, I mean, in the, in the music business, it's JB and Rocky. And, you know, it's a, it's a life we have now. And now it's kind of like, that's crazy because it's like now we have a genre that represents the, the, the Mexican-American culture, but in Spanish, which is amazing. I, I'm, out, I'm out there for our people, man. We gotta make sure our people are good. 
I wish everybody was experiencing what I'm experiencing. It's amazing. Desde abajo is from the, from the bottom, man. We call it from the gutter, you know, and I couldn't name it from the gutter in Spanish. Like I couldn't, I didn't find a translation, but desde abajo means that, like, you know, that song really represents me. First we called it El Chicano. You know, that was the first name of it. And I go, El Chicano, he was like, he was like, all right, and who's doing it? I said, me. I was like, get the hell out of here, bro. And he was like, dude, let's do it. So I went in there and yeah, I struggled a little bit, but after a good 20 minutes, man, it was, it was like butter, man. I went in there and he's like, dude, sing with your heart, you know, sing how you feel about it. And I did, I did what I felt about it. And he was like, dude, this song was for you. Like you were meant to sing this song. We gave a real story. And, and to me, it was, it's kind of like a message to these kids. You know, growing up, I didn't have a Mexican American or somebody in the hood that I looked up to as an entrepreneur that I said, I want to be like that guy. I think a lot of the kids are looking at me like that right now. And, and the reason why I said something in English was because the message was meant to be in English because a lot of these kids that listen to this music and a lot of the people that listen to it, they're all bilingual, you know, the majority. And, and even the people in Mexico send me the, like, yo, now I know what it means. Like, that's cool, bro. You know, they, 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 they send us messages online and stuff. And, and it's pretty dope, man, because I really meant that. You know, it's like, it's like, don't give up. You know, it's like, I had so many opportunities to give up in life. I had so many of them. It was the wee easy way out, you know? And I would just hear my dad, like, keep going. Like, you know, just don't stop. Just. Like, you know, I heard my dad all the time, dude. And I was like, dude, like, keep going, don't stop. And I really wanted to relate that message, you know? You know, it was fucked up in life, dude, because growing up, growing up in the neighborhood, you don't have the help from everybody. This is why I don't talk about my life. <laughs> you know, growing up in the neighborhood, man, you don't, there's a lot of outreach programs that get in there. And, and to me, it was like, that was our angels, you know? I was blessed, man. And you know, a lot of the, a lot of the people that make it out the hood, man, go back to the hood. Like, serious. You don't go back to the hood, man. These kids need us. They need, they need a good message, you know? It's like a lot of these kids, I know what it's like to, I knew what it was like to live in a one bedroom with 10 people living in the house, you know? I see one of these kids come up and they start crying and it's like I relate to them, you know? It's like I go out there, bro, and whatever I have on me is like my people see me. Whatever money I got, sometimes I try to help families, you know? I see they not doing too good, man. You know, I'm blessed, man, you know? I don't think anybody has ever seen this side of me, man, and it's hard. Everybody that makes it out, it doesn't take nothing for you to go back and, you know, just inspire some of these kids, man. Let them sit in your car, let them, you know, one thing for me was to sit in that nice car, you know? That when I got to sit in that Impala, it was like, dude, like that was a, a goal. Like it was a goal for me, you know? It was like, I got to experience something that I thought I would never do, you know? Just coming from a gutter, man, and, and is that, that song just tells my life, you know? And I did cry up when I did that song, you know? I did tear up. I sent a shout out to my dad, to my mom, to my brothers and sisters, to just everybody that has helped me to, to get where we at right now. Like all my interviews are always about music, so it's like, and they know what, it, you know? So this is crazy. <laughs> Low writing is my time off, man. It's like, as soon as I hop in this car, it's like, like I'm away from everything. I'm away from life. I'm out there, I'm zoned out. I'm at, I'm at a kid at the candy store, you know? I'm in a roller coaster, man. I'm in, I'm having fun, I'm being me. When I'm out there low riding, it's, I, I go out there and I see all these kids and, and they wanna come up to me. And if I have a hat on, I'll take my hat on and give it to them. I've gave away sunglasses. A lot of these kids grow up without dads and stuff. And you know, not because their dad leaves and stuff, but it's just because their dad is at work. You know, it was like my dad, my dad was a, he worked graveyard. So it's like, my dad wasn't at a lot of my baseball games. He wasn't a lot of stuff like that, but it's like, I understood why, you know what I mean? But, and I appreciate that now. But a lot of these kids have the same life. You know, their dad goes to work, they're construction workers, they're gardeners, they work at warehouses. They're out there really doing that, 
Mexican job, you know, and they look up to you maybe because you're different than their parents and stuff. I always try to teach them that positive message. Like, don't give up. Like, there's more out there. You're gonna hear so many no's and you're gonna hear so many doors shut on you. But in this world, there wasn't only one door made. Go knock. If one doesn't open, you know, knock on the other. Don't be afraid. I mean, I made no part of my life. You know, it's like, I would hear so many no's, like, oh, whatever, dude. You know, still to this day, when I hear a no, it's like, to me, it's like a try again. I know it's hard out there. I, th I thank God that I got, I went through everything I did. So many doors shut on me. It was a training for me. That was my school. Don't give up, man. You know, it, it takes, it takes guts to do what you really want to do in life. My name is Jimmy Omile. Pearl Hernandez Seiler. Josh Dubon. China man. Cesu Silva. Jason Madiedo. Frank Silva. Beto Mendoza. Marco Sariano. I'm a music producer. I'm a tech entrepreneur. I'm a legal representative. I'm a lowrider photographer. Legal fire department. And I am a lowrider role model. model.